If you have your Bibles, open the book of 1 Corinthians. I'd ask you this morning to contemplate this question, why do you love America? Why do you love America? Now we do live in interesting times and it seems that it is always easier to criticize than to compliment, right? That's how we're kind of driven sometimes. And I'm not asking why we don't like things in America, but why do you like America? Some would say, well, I love the variety of the views in America. You can go from mountains to rolling hills to the oceans, right, and prairies. And it's beautiful, and truly, we have a beautiful country, even in Saginaw, Michigan. I happen to like Saginaw, and I'm not from Saginaw. You say, what's wrong with you, Pastor? Well, there's a lot of things wrong with me, okay? But I like, I like America. Some would say, well, it's the views and all the variety in America. There's some beautiful places throughout this great country. Some would say, well, I love the food. There's not much else in the world like, like a McDonald's cheeseburger. Some of you have traveled internationally and you've got a burger from a McDonald's out of the country. And you're like, it's not the same. As somehow the cheeseburger, uh, the Big Mac, or, or the burger there, that's like the epitome of burgers. And of course, it's just fine dining at McDonald's. But beyond that, we have just a variety of food in America, do we not? From pizza, which is not really Italian, to Taco Bell, which is not really Mexican, <laughs> to steak, which is good any day of the week, any time of the week. Some would say it's the food. Some would say it's the people. We love the, the mixture of people in America, the melting pot. And what a blessing that is that we're all not the same. We don't all look the same. We don't all think the same. We don't all act the same. And that's a blessing, especially for you that you don't act like me and vice versa. Some would say the people, some the food. But I think we all could agree at the end of the day we're thankful for America, one of the greatest attributes is its liberty and freedom. Is it not? Last night I came to midnight prayer meeting with the men, jumped in my truck, drove over here, and no one asked to see my papers. No one said, what are, what are you doing tonight? Why are you out and about? I just got in my truck and I came here. I could have, if they were open, stopped by and got a taco from Taco Bell if I had lost my mind. The freedom, if I want to go to Georgia tomorrow, I could. I'd go to Georgia today if I wanted to, right? If you want to buy a blue truck, you can buy a blue truck. And if you want to buy a Ford, you're allowed to buy a Ford. The freedom of this great country. We truly are grateful to have that freedom. A freedom that is really not found really anywhere else. It's a great country. But as you know, and as I want to remind us this morning, that freedom wasn't free. In fact, I want to focus a little bit on the, the war, a revolutionary war, the war for independence, 1770s. That war that I found, one historian said that America had no business winning. No business winning. In fact, uh, they said some things about this, that when they're debating, uh, Britain was debating whether to come and, and to fight the Americans to fight the colonies. Boy, I wonder if they want to go back and change that now. When they came to fight us, they had some big sessions in the parliament. This historian said that there was no reason that America should have won the Revolutionary War. And though the government in Britain debated many things, there's one, one thing that they settled upon collectively and that the Americans would pose little challenge in the event of a war. We would pose just a little bit of a problem to them, to that great superpower known as Britain and England. They said the Americans at that point had neither a standing army nor navy. Few of, among them were experienced officers. Britain possessed a professional army and the world's greatest navy at that time. And furthermore, the colonists... Uh, here in, uh, in the Mer America had no history of working together. That has held true throughout the, throughout the years, has it not? <laughs> in addition, the, uh, the assessments of American soldiers, they described American soldiers as cowardly dogs. That's the wrong thing to say to a bunch of Americans. 
That's a wrong thing to lead off with, is it not? There are a few things you could say about us, but if someone goes up to Mary and says, you're a cowardly dog, them are fighting words, right? And then we'll get your blood royal, uh, boiling right there. And they said that the colonists were a poor species of fighting men, and they were given to a lack, a want of bravery. But boy, were they surprised. Were they not? I'm glad they're surprised because that's when I can stand up here and preach what I think I ought to preach from God's Word. I'm glad they're surprised. I'm glad, I think you're glad they were surprised by the, the, the bravery that they thought was lacking in the Americans because now you can go to Walmart and buy whatever color shirt you want to buy because of that freedom. There's a man by the name of Samuel Whitmore. He was born in 1696 and died in 1793. He was an American farmer and soldier. And he was 78 years old when he became the oldest known colonial combatant. He was the oldest guy serving with the army, the militia at that time. He was the old guy, 78 years old. I think, Brother Edwards, are you 77 right now? Are are you 77, Brother Edwards? Somewhere in there? Yes, sir. You're 80s. Oh, man, okay, you'd be older. He was 78 when he went... And he picked up a rifle. He had fought in in two other wars. His last battle was when he was 64. He was no stranger to fighting. And Samuel Whitmore, in 1775, saw a group of British soldiers about to attack. They were marching to an engagement. He was in the fields working his farm when he saw these British soldiers this brigade, under General Earl Percy. He quickly grabbed and lowered his musket, as the story goes, and hid behind the wall and shot one of the British soldiers. Having expended that musket in that round, he then grabbed his two dueling pistols, killed a second soldier, and mortally wounded a third. By that time, the British detachment came to see what was hurting their brigade, and they came across Samuel Whitmore who out of ammunition and out of his guns, now not loaded, grabbed his sword. He then was shot and bayoneted multiple times and left for dead, but was found. He was found by some colonial forces. When they found him, left for dead, he was struggling to reload his musket to get back in the fight. That's what the British soldiers didn't count on. I'm proud to be an American. I'm thankful for our heritage. Just so you know, he received the diagnosis for no hope of survival, yet he did survive. Went on to live for 18 more years until he finally passed away, like I said, in 1793, dying of natural causes. A true American hero. A man's man. This morning I want to look at briefly from 1 Corinthians the victory that we have. Bring some thoughts to us from God's Word in correlation to the victory that God gave this great nation so many years ago. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 54, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, Then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for the men and the women who have served our country who are with us this morning. Lord, we want to honor them and thank them. But Lord, we want to honor you and thank you this morning. Without your hand upon us, none of this would be possible. Lord, thank you for Jesus and for what he did for us. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us have our hearts turned towards you today. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I want us to notice just three brief points this morning, kind of in correlation to the War of Independence. 
I would say, first of all, the first point is this. There is an enemy that we all face. There's an enemy that we all face. You see, when they uh, declared war, they, everyone here in the colonies, faced one enemy. One enemy. Whether you liked it or not, all right, you were now at war. Whether you wanted to be or not, and there were obviously uh, some sympathizers, some loyalists back and forth, but, but whether you like it or not, there was a common enemy, a common foe. You couldn't stick your head in the sand in the 1770s, could you? Everywhere you looked, there was uh, marks of this, there, was battle, there were battles going on. There was an enemy that we all faced, that they all faced. There are countless stories, countless accounts of men and women who risked life and land to fight for our freedom. Ways that you can see God's hand at work inside of all those stories. Amazing stories against all odds. It's reading about George Washington. and It's interesting how later on in history people kind of try to rewrite history. You ever notice that? Begin to rewrite history and they say, well, George Washington, he was not a strategist. All right, he wasn't actually a very good general at all. He was just a good politician. I'm not here to debate that or not. He happened to be the general. We happened to win. So I figured that brings some credibility. Whether he was good or not, he won. Right? So maybe he just surrounded good people around him. Even then, that was a smart move. Either way, he won. Right? So I figured that counts for something. They talked about, though, in these stories and accounts, how at times that, boy, the British could have won multiple times, but they did it. They made wrong choices. Boy, hindsight's always 20-20, isn't it? Easy to, to rain on someone else's parade. Oh, boy, you shouldn't have done that. I could have told you that wouldn't work. But you see God's hand all around us in our history and in our present. God's protecting us all the time. In fact, this last week, I almost met our maker. So I think I'm cutting the grass this past week in my John Deere lawnmower. Rest in peace, John Deere lawnmower. I see some smoke coming out of the front of the lawnmower. I say, well, that's not very odd. It burns a little bit of oil. There's always a little bit of white smoke coming out. Well, I make another pass in my yard, and I realize, boy, that smoke smells like a bonfire. Normally, my lawnmower doesn't smell like a bonfire. So I stop, and I, you know, pull down the throttle, stop the blades, and I lift up the front of the lawnmower, and there's orange flames in the bottom of the lawnmower coming up, orange flames. My heart was beating 100 miles. <laughs> it was going like this. I jump off and run to my garage. I was scared to death, I'll be honest with you, all right? Um, I'm thinking, you know how your mind just goes 100 different ways? I'm thinking, all right, liquid gas does not burn, but fumes explode. I did not fill up my lawnmower before I started. There's only a little bit of gas left. I was trying to make it just last till the end thinking this thing's going up and I'm gone. I'm out of here. I run to my garage and I grab the fire extinguisher. I actually have one in my garage. It actually worked. <laughs> if that's not the hand of God, I don't know what is. I sprayed it on the way over. I come back out of my garage, run it back there. I stand behind this large, this large tree. The lawnmower's over here. You said, were you afraid, Pastor Hell? Absolutely. I come back to the lawnmower. Now there's flames on top of the mower too, just orange flames all over this whole thing now. And I'm like, this thing's going to blow up. Now you, got, you have that decision time. Do you make a run for it or watch or burn tea out your phone and helps it, hope it goes viral? <laughs> well, I made a diving pass for it and sprayed, uh, sprayed um, uh, the fire extinguisher at it. Wouldn't you know it, I'm a terrible fire extinguisher guy because it was still on fire. <laughs> I had to make two passes. <laughs> it got it all out and we towed it back to the, back to the barn. But God is good, isn't he? God is good. He's good all the time, even with the enemies that we face. And, and we faced an enemy back then, but you know that we still face an enemy today? That's what this, these verses tell us. There's an enemy, and its name is death, sin. Inescapable. No one can escape death. But people have tried from the fountain of youth, and now they're trying with the genetics. In fact, there's a scientist out there who has now made yeast live a hundred times past its time frame that it should. And he said, if we can transfer this to humans, humans can live to be 800 years old. Well, Mr. Scientist, I'd like you to read your Bible. That's already been done. That's already happened. It's nothing new under the sun. But he said, wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, there are some days and some days that some of you would be like, I don't want to live to 800 years old. 
Death seems undefeatable. Sin, there's no way around it. Oh, sometimes people say, well, I've escaped death. What I mean by that is they had a brush with circumstances that could have caused death, like mine and a lawnmower. If you're ever on the internet, you can find YouTube videos of people who barely missed being hit or this or that. And they, wow, they escaped death. The fact is, none of us can escape death. There, there is no way. It is a point that a man wants to die. It is an enemy, a foe that is inescapable. No one has ever de- defeated death. No man has ever conquered death. No one has ever cheated death until Jesus came along. Until Jesus came along. You see, there is a, an enemy that we all face, but there is one who fought for all of us. His name is Jesus. I read that little synopsis of what the British politicians thought of us as soldiers. I remind you what everyone thought of Jesus when he came to earth. There is no way that this man can do anything. Sure, he can do a, a few tricks, they said. But we can stump him with some well-thought-out questions until they couldn't. We can defeat him by selling him for a few pieces of silver. Back in the Old Testament, at the Garden of Eden, the victory of Jesus was promised to us. It was promised to us where the Bible says of the seed of Eve that he will bruise its heel, but he's going to bruise your head. The, the victory was promised to us. There is one that, um, that it was planned before time, before, G, before all of time. His name is Jesus. Before we even thought of, the victory was already planned. See, there's an enemy we all face. His name is death and, and sin. But there is, one, there is one who fought for us. His name is Jesus. Tyler's message of the last song that Dalton's and Brother Dylan sang was, He took the hill. He took the hill Jesus did by storm. There was no stopping him. There was no hindering him. Oh, the old devil thought he had won when Christ hung on the cross until the sky went black, until the veil was ripped in half, thought he had won, until the graves were opened and saints were walking around the city of Jerusalem. Until that point, they thought they had won. He was perfect. He was perfect. How does Jesus keep on tricking us the religious leaders of that time were trying to figure out they had meetings about jesus they gathered together to say how can we stop this guy everyone loves him everyone wants to be around him they had meetings to figure out how to stop jesus and they could find no fault in him if you remember when they finally put him on trial Pilate says i can find no fault in this man Nothing. Fact is, if you or I were put on trial, they could find some fault. They could find something, could they not? Fact is, they could find many things. But not with King Jesus. No, no, sir, no, ma'am. Pilate could find no fault. He was perfect. He was sinless. He was provisional. He died in your place, in my place. We are surrounded in our history by men and women who have sacrificially given them themselves for their fellow soldiers and ultimately for you and for me. Does it seem like sometimes they're unappreciated? Americans, does it seem that way sometimes? Maybe it's because my brother, like I mentioned, serves in the Navy. I love service men and women. I'm thankful for what they do. I'm thankful for it. the time, the commitment. I know what my brother has to do as a, as a, a pilot for the Navy. The training he's put in, my brother with the, the sense of responsibility that he feels. For a while he was, flying, he was flying planes that would be a mobile command center for the United States. In fact, when he first got this first assignment, they did uh, background checks on family members as well. Apparently I'm not as crazy as you think I am. <laughs> flying generals around and um, Admiral around as well. And I knew that he felt the responsibility of that, even to land the plane gently. I found out, I can't even tell you what his flight is, is his call sign is. He can tell you when he comes sometime, but he's a good pilot. But we're surrounded in our history by men and women who sacrifice themselves for somebody else. I say thank you. I read this, this story. Medal of Honor was given to a Navy SEAL by the name of Michael Monsoor. 
Michael grew up in a family where helping others was a way of life. His father was a Marine and his mother was a social worker. Together they raised four children to understand the meaning of service and sacrifice. His story goes that he was somewhat unlikely to be a, a candidate for the Navy. He suffered from terrible asthma. And on some nights his coughing fits as a child would cause him to have to go to the hospital. But Michael would not lay low for long. He strengthened his lungs by racing his siblings in the swimming pool. He worked to wean himself off his inhaler and became a superb athlete, excelling in from sports like football to snowboarding. He enlisted in the Navy and then began to prepare for the ultimate test of physical endurance. He wanted to become a Navy SEAL. Less than a third of those who began SEAL training actually become a, thir- uh, become a SEAL. And a few years later, Michael earned the right to wear the trident of a Navy SEAL. They were deployed, and he brought that same go get em attitude with him. During 75% of their missions, his platoon was under attack. 75% of his of missions, his platoon. Michael returned fire, kept on fighting. But it was on September 29th, a few years ago, that Mike and two teammates had taken a position on a rooftop when an insurgent grenade bounced off Mike's chest and landed on the roof. He had a clear chance to escape, but the other two SEALs would not make it. He had two options, save himself or save his friends, his fellow soldiers. Apparently for Mike, this was no choice at all. He threw himself on the grenade and absorbed the blast with his body. One of his friends, survivors that day, said, Mike, Mikey looked at death and said, You cannot take my brothers, I will go in their stead. And he was awarded Medal of Honor. We admire that. We respect that. We honor that. Yet there was a man named Jesus who took the blast for you and for me who willingly left heaven, left all the glory, came to earth, lived a sinless and a perfect life, willing to suffer grief, mocking, and shame. And all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, willingly went to the cross. As the song goes, he could have called 10,000 angels. And while the song is a great song, it got it wrong. He could have called 10 trillion angels. Would have been no problem that day for King Jesus. Yet he willingly took the blast for you and for me. You see, we come to Patriotic Sunday. I think we ought to remember and be thankful, be reminded of the sacrifice that men and women have made so that we can sit here in air conditioning and enjoy our lives. And as Christians, we ought to be reminded of what Jesus did so we can sit here and enjoy our blessed lives. See, Jesus took the penalty for us He paid the price for our sin. He defeated the largest foe that we could face. And he is the ultimate, the ultimate victor. See, there was an enemy we all face. There was the one who fought for us all. But there's the benefits we can all receive. I listed down some benefits that we all receive because we're a free country. I'd like you to think of some as well. I I won't ask for them out loud. One I thought of initially, we don't have to drink tea. Those who know me know I drink coffee. Some of you drink tea, but you drink it by choice. We all can't make good choices in life. I'll pray for you. Right? The Boston Tea Party? It wasn't about the tea, it's about the taxes, but we don't have to drink tea. We can drive on the right side of the road. Right? We can measure things in the hardest way known to man rather than a metric, simple metric system. No, not as Americans. We'll confuse with quarts and pints and cups and inches and all that. And we can do that. Rather than lay out cities and nice little grids, we can make them all messed up with roads any way we want to. Winding passages. We're independent. 
We have freedom. We can worship as we see fit. What a privilege. There is not a national religion or a national uh, religious figure. There is freedom of religion in America. And sure, I know. Some of you will think, yeah, but Pastor Hall, it's under attack. Of course it is. Of course it is. But don't forget, Christians have always been under attack. Jesus said, don't, don't be surprised. They hated me first. The benefits we all receive as Americans... I love our flag, red, white, and blue. I love the big ones. I love going past a car dealership and seeing what seems like a hundred foot flag. That's cool. If I could put one in my yard, I would. Just wouldn't put my lawnmower by so I wouldn't burn it up. I love that. I love fireworks. I'm looking forward to Tuesday night where Brother Ryan and some men will launch some fireworks here at First Baptist Church. You know what my favorite part of fireworks is? This is going to be silly. You'll laugh at me. This is my favorite part of fireworks. When you're close enough to feel the, con the concussive blast in your chest. Boom. Hit it again. Do it again. The fireworks. Man, I like fireworks. The bigger, the better. I don't mind if they're little, ni nice little shapes. That's okay. Just blast them full in the sky. That's okay as well. What color? Any color you've got. I love being American. I love the freedom we have. But I love more being a Christian. The benefits we receive. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you've never gotten the benefit of His victory, you can trust Him today. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Because I'm a Christian, I have freedom from death. Oh sure, I'll shed this old body, but I'll live forever with Jesus Christ. I'm going to live forever. I'm only going to die when Jesus dies and he's living forever. I'm going to be like Jesus. The freedom that he brings, the freedom from sin. I'm not a slave to sin. I get to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And my Bible says he's a good master. He's a friend. That's what he calls me. I get to be a joint heir with Jesus. I get to be a relationship or a, or a brother to Jesus. We're called the, we are called the sons. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Payment from sin, penalty of sin. Death once defeated, lost its ultimate whole. And sin's been defeated. There's a congressional record of a 19-year-old soldier. He was rewarded a medal for bringing in a large group of Japanese prisoners single-handedly during World War II. He responded to this hearing and to this medal by saying, I don't deserve this medal. And here's the story he told. He said, along with five of my fellow soldiers, I was captured by the Japanese soldiers. We were marched through the jungles with bayonets at our backs and guns pointed at us. One by one, my comrades fell off. He said, and I began to recite the 23rd Psalm. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When I finished that, I said the Lord's Prayer. Though I was certain I would die, I would determine not to let my captors see my fear. Marching through mud up to my ankles, trembling from head to foot, I began to whistle as I used to when I was a small boy walking through a darkened street. I whistled, we gather together to ask the Lord's blessings. He hastens and chastens his will to make known. I suddenly became aware that somebody else had joined me in my whistling. It was my Japanese captor. I felt his gun removed from my back. He began to walk beside me and then in perfect English said, I never cease to wonder at the magnificence of Christian hymns. Soldier wanted to say, I soon learned that this man had accepted Christ at an English mission school, to which I had contributed to my two in my Sunday school days. He said, We begin to talk about the war and talk about how the, some of the Japanese Christians hated the war. We talked of the power of the gospel and how the world would change if people would bear, dare to live by the precepts of Christ. And finally, at his suggestion, we knelt in the mud 
and pray for the lost and suffering people around the world. When we stood up, he asked if I would take him back as a prisoner to the American headquarters. He explained it was the only way he could live up to his Christianity and help thus Japan become a Christian nation. So I agreed. On the way back to American headquarters, American lines, we passed various foxholes where we found other Japanese Christians who also chose to join us. The soldier said, I'll never forget the hope and the joy that came into their eyes. They learned of our plan and our desire to honor Christ. We talked of Christ and our faith in Him all the way back. When we neared the camp, by mutual agreement, they put on their folk poker faces and somber looks, and I, gun in hand, marched them into the camp. So you see, I deserve no medal for the most wonderful experience in my life. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. There's an enemy we all face. There's the one who faced it for us, and there are benefits that we all can receive. If you've never trusted Christ today, I pray that you'll trust him today. And if you've trusted Christ, may you be reminded of what Christ has done for you and for me. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the victory you've given to us through Jesus. Lord, may we be reminded of that. May we be challenged by that. Lord, may we not go complacent to what you've done. Lord, I also thank you for this country and what you've done here. Lord, I pray that in this great country that many folks will be touched by the gospel. Now their heads